attention. Welcome to the Different Spectrums podcast. We dive into the wild world of mental health discussions. Get ready for profound talks, a sprinkle of humor and sarcasm, and a touch of colorful language. Just a quick heads up, our show reflects our individual opinions, which may not align with the standpoint of the podcast, our featured guests, or any related corporate entities. Our mission? To illuminate through laughter and satire, because everyone needs a good chuckle. Chill out and don't stress over the small stuff. Legal troubles? No thank you. Cancel culture? Please spare us. We'd rather keep this space lawsuit-free. So buckle up, have a good time, and join us as we navigate the vibrant realm of mental health on the Different Spectrums podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. By using our link, you can get 10% off your first month of therapy. So Nas, as a therapist on BetterHelp, what has your experience been like? I've been doing it since January of 2021, and it's been really fun and exciting. I've been able to reach clients all over the United States and the world. I've had good relationships. I've had folks that I've had for a couple months and a good handful where I've had for almost two years now. Uh, so it's magnificent. I've enjoyed my time and my clients. I love them. Awesome. You can do it all from your phone or computer via phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel the most comfortable. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you all from the comfort of your own home. Visit BetterHelp.com slash DSP or choose Different Spectrums Podcast during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. Hey everybody, we back again. <laughs> hey, we're back. We're live. I'm Spencer, of course, that's our licensed clinical therapist, Nas. They call me doctor now. <laughs> clinical doctor. Anybody in this room? Me- nope. me- med- medical doctor. I got to practice. And you know, I'll cut you open. Do you? Yep. Do you? Nope. Oh, where? Tijuana. All right. Well, moving on from that, remember, don't take us too seriously. <laughs> or do. It's completely up to you. There you go. Also, don't forget to wrap those likes for us. So today we have a special guest. Uh, she is a mindfulness and performance coach with athletes all over the country, um, as well as a licensed master of social work and also a former D1 athlete and collegiate coach. Uh, she's also a director and on the medical advisory council for Morgan's Message. Please welcome Emily Perrin. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. Oh, I know, right? and a hand clap. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you can't hear it, but they're there. They're there. They're there, people. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for having me. So excited to be here. Hell yeah. We're we're very happy to have you here and uh, to talk about our our show for today, Daisy Jones and the Six. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, some topics we're going to be covering is coping, um, childhoods and you know depending on your parents like what that kind of means um and then also some drug use in there yeah yeah so a lot of saw a lot of sugar Uh, there's a lot of didn't didn't go in the coffee i'll tell you that (laughs) it went right up my nose (laughs) (laughs) nah is anything before we get into the show one of my clients uh, random side story before I get into the real story. <laughs> yep. What? Story before a story. See, you know, That's it's the pre-story. It. You know, I like to make sure it's warmed up. You know. Yep. He doesn't talk a lot on this podcast, so he decided to have a story time before <laughs> the story time. Yeah. You're making me like a it. narcissist. You are. <laughs> what are you talking it's about? It's autism. <laughs> okay. Okay. Self-diagnosed. Uh, self-diagnosed. Um. <laughs> shut the fuck. God damn it. You throw me <laughs> off. Um, I had a client, a couple clients from New York and right. I've never, you don't really hear too much about cocaine usage in the Midwest, you yeah. know, mushrooms. Yeah, for sure. Tons of weed, tons of weed. And then cocaine, really not so much. Uh, then I got some clients out in New York and they're like, Oh yeah, you know, everyone's doing cocaine. It's like, Oh, that's interesting. So this is, this is cultural. Uh, when it comes to New Yorkans, Mm-hmm. New Yorkans. I don't know if that's a word. New Yorkans. <laughs> New Yorkers. <laughs> New Yorkans. <laughs> New- <laughs> you idiots. <laughs> they even have a magazine yeah. called that. You I like New Yorkans. 
New York is. I was just shocked. She's like, oh, yeah, everyone's doing cocaine. I was like, are you doing cocaine? She's like, yeah, I'm doing cocaine. Can we stop doing the cocaine? You're anxious as shit, goddammit. It's part of my culture. Don't make me change. I know, as a New Yorker. Nick. Don't make me change. Uh, so I want to get into a legit uh, quick thing. So as a lot of folks know, but this podcast will be out maybe like three, four weeks, you know, after this. It was graduation to all the universities. And it's a magnificent time for everyone, families, the kids, right? It's awesome. Um, but if you go in little sub pockets, there'll be like social work, you know, graduations where it just be them, little pockets, right? But some of the bigger schools, they got it to where it's just the cultural houses. So it's just, a, you know, the Latino cultural center, the black cultural center, the queer center, right? They'll have these like small little gatherings, very, very loving. And boy, I tell you, it was awesome, man, watching the kids go up there. And, you know, out of the 100 kids that graduated, right, I've seen at least seven of them just from this was the COVID class. Then every year I start seeing bigger and bigger percentages of these major universities, these pockets, uh, Latinx kids. And boy, I tell you, a couple of my boys went up there and they started talking. And like one was just crying. I'm like, huh? Huh? This is too much. Magnificent to see these uh, these pockets uh, of students, and as we know, immigrants uh, are the biggest uh, business owners in America. Where they're the ones opening all these new businesses all the time. It's a lot of immigrants and immigrant families. So it's magnificent to see all these Spanish speakers, these dreamers, these kids that are undocumented, right? And they're going through a lot of shit. And then here they have these bright, shiny degrees at one of the best universities for engineering in America. I always like to say that best engineering schools, one of the top three in America, and they're doing it. And it's magnificent to see this, this brown joy uh, and to know that I'm the one that helped him get there through all the shit. So it's really cool. I was sitting back there fucking balling my eyes out, Spence. I even texted you. I'm like, this is intense. <laughs> yep. And then the moms go up there and start talking. It was just magnificent. So shout out to everyone that listens to podcasts. If you have any family members that are graduated, whether you'd be, you know, immigrant, whether it be black, whether it be brown, whether it be first generation, single mom, uh, you know, or neurodivergent as hell, autistic as hell, and you struggled and you got a lot of services and you made it. Shout out to everyone that's graduated, whether high school or college. All right. Let's get to the show. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. Hey. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Only what, there, what do you do with your arms? <laughs> <laughs> it was my Don King impression. Don King. <laughs> America. A great American man. <laughs> the best American man. He's actually man. terrible. Yeah, he's actually terrible. He is a terrible person. He's terrible. Yeah, terrible. Okay. Let's anyway, get, let's get, get a show. show. Yeah. Easy is. She was born with every advantage. Her father's money, her mother's beauty. Excuse me. She had anything and everything at her disposal. And yet, she was completely alone. I swear she was put on this earth to embarrass me.
on, we seemed to notice something had changed. One night, and everything changed. Supposed to be in Georgia, Graham. Well, he's not, all right? I bet he never even fucking left. What's wrong with you guys? Hey, not now, Eddie. You sound great tonight, man. And you were fucking ripping in there. What's going on? You see the guy in there in the plaid suit? Who, the creepster with the comb over and the girl half his age? Yeah, he's our dad. I mean, I was four when he left. So I never really had a father. But it was different for Billy. He worshiped the guy. I'm gonna say something. Billy, no. Billy, hey, no, I Billy. have to. Oh, Help you? Yeah, you know who I am. Should I? Yeah, you should. Well, then of course I do. I'd recognize that guitar anywhere. Anything else? Hey, it's not worth it, all right? Let's go home. Take it. Come on, take it. I said fucking take it! I've got no use for it. I gave it to you. Something to remember me by. There you go, asshole. Oh. Oh. Guess we're not getting paid for that gig, huh? Billy, you okay, man? I can still see the look. you think you're doing, Billy? What the fuck is wrong with you? If you think that I'm gonna let you ruin our life, my life, I don't give a fuck what you do until this baby comes, but when it does, you are gonna show up for me. Look at me! You are gonna show up for me, for this child, and you're gonna keep showing up for the rest of your goddamn life. Do you understand? Do you understand? Hey everyone, have you been looking for something to help you when you feel extra fidgety? How about when you have a sensory overload? Well, I'm here to introduce you 
to the Ono Fidget Roller. It helps me regulate and also feel at ease. The Ono Roller comes in five different materials, including plastic, aluminum, steel, titanium, and silicone. You can use our code DSP10 to get 10% off your order when you visit onoroller.com and get your roll on. All right, we're back again. We're back and we're live. Just live is Liquid Death, a wonderful drink that I'm promoting. They're not our sponsors, but they should be. Why Why are you promoting them then? I'm, I'm, because I'm drinking it right now. And my dad goes, I emailed them. They have not emailed us back. Those bastards. <laughs> Fuck those bastards. Don't buy this shit. I, I, Don't yeah. buy it. <laughs> Even though I did love their tea. Their, um, their peach tea it was delicious. So Love a good peach. Anyways, <laughs> uh, we have a guest here. Uh, <laughs> Emily. Emily. Um, just kind of want to get into it right away. Um, you're a former D1 athlete as well as a collegiate coach. Um, how did you address your mental health back then? Ooh. And what would you change now that you're in the position you are in? Oh, gosh. Well, I think I do what I do for a living because I I I can't say that I didn't address my mental health. But, you know, when I was in college we weren't having the conversations that we're having now around mental health. We weren't talking about it. It wasn't a thing. And it was still very taboo. Um, You know, I am pretty open about my own mental health journey and have been through some pretty significant stuff, childhood trauma. And I think that really impacted a lot of my life and my career as an athlete. And I have been in therapy since I was 13, right? So I I did have help. I did. I mean, my family was one that was fortunate enough to have access to resources and good health care, right? However, I think we are now moving in a time where the conversation around mental health and taking much more proactive measures around overall well-being, right? Which we know sometimes I feel like the term mental health is a little misleading, right? Because like, the mind and body are, are constantly talking to each other. They don't work separately, right? So a lot of times what we're talking about when we talk about mental health is is overall holistic well-being. And I don't think we were having those conversations. We were not having those conversations around how to take care of ourselves. We were not, um, those certainly were not things that I was thinking about. They were not things that I was equipped with. Um, so in that way, you know, sure. Did, did I go to therapy when I was a college athlete? Yes. Did anybody know? No. Was I doing a bunch of other things to take care of my mental health or overall health and well-being? Not really. Um, and so I think that has actually shaped a lot of why I do what I do today, because we are moving in a time where I mean, look at the college programs that I work with. People are bringing people in like me to address exactly this. So I think that's a main driver in why I do what I do. Awesome. Totally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, read a little bit about you. Um, I know your dad was an assistant coach for a UVA for almost 20 years or so, and then um, started to do his own practice um, when it comes to like performance coaching. Um, Did that drive you to also go into this field or did you just feel like I really want to be in here because of, you know, my own journeys as well? Yeah, both. And I, it's hard to, I mean, our parents, as we're going to talk about when we get into the, the show, our parents, our family units are so influential in our lives. And from a very young age, I mean, I literally was born and then two months later was sitting courtside at a basketball stadium. Right. I mean, that was my life because back in the day when UVA played at U-Haul, like the family sat on the court. Right. I mean, this was the, you know, early nineties, like there, we, we didn't have stadiums like we have today. Right. Um, And so I grew up in a locker room. I grew up in a a team. I mean, I grew up right back in the day. I mean, families would ride the bus with the team to games, right? So that, that was the life that, and, and then, you know, my dad, yes, he has a PhD in sports psychology. So, I mean, I had some of, you know, men's soccer in particular, because my dad went to a couple of world cups. Like most people know the name Landon Donovan, right? Like Landon Donovan was calling our home line when I was a kid. So it, I was really exposed to that from a very young age. 
and just listening to some of the, you know, conversations and the work that my dad was doing at eight, nine, 10 years old. So yes, I, that absolutely was really influential. And at the same time, I think the, the world of sports psychology and kind of performance or mindset coaching is not necessarily mental health. Do they overlap? Yes. Yep. But I, I have to say that, sure, I saw that in my own household and mental health was still not a thing that we were really talking about. So yes, my dad was 1000% influential. And today, to this day, it's incredible. We worked on a couple projects together and he's such a mentor and kind of a role model for me. And I think my own journey has also paved my own path, kind of my own niche and my own style and my own flavor. Um, flavor is kind of an interesting word to use, but I'm going to use know. it flavor yeah, in how hey. I work for people and what I do. You know, it's got, you know, I don't know how much flavoring it is, go. you know, because you, you know, white people don't use flavorings, but you know, Oh my God. <laughs> you know, she's like, I got a little spice. <laughs> I got, I got salt in there. It's spicy. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 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 My tummy hurts. <laughs> no, pause. Uh, we use flavor yeah. all the time when we're talking about like autism. Where are you at? Is it not spiced? Or are you like deep fried? Um, <laughs> and it's all of it is autism. All of it. All of it is valid. Uh, question. Mm? You pivoted. You, you, did, you did a social work degree. So, right? I'm a doctor in social work. Master's in social work for years. Why social work? You know, it's the only okay. degree there is that actually counts, but you know, but why? Yeah. Okay. So I actually, my therapist, when I, um, I've had a couple pretty like rock bottoms in my life. And one was actually when I left college coaching okay. when I was 20 six. And that was really the first time that I'd ever left sport. I mean, when I graduated, um, and finished my college career at UVA, I went straight into coaching. So, you know, when I left college coaching at 26, I mean, I had, I had a lot going on mental health wise. I was kind of living in a chronic state of panic and anxiety, but I was okay. also having an identity crisis, right? I had no idea who I was, what I wanted to be doing, had a relationship that just went very sideways. And, um, my therapist, I, I found a therapist that really was doing amazing trauma work, was doing EMDR and she was a social worker. She was an LCSW and through our work together and, you know, kind of putting two and two together, I was like, LCSW, like, what does that mean? I never even had to be fair, heard of it. And she really opened my eyes to the field of social work. And I'm a pretty curious creature by nature. And so when I knew and kind of landed on the, the general path of how I wanted to start working with people, I knew I was going to have to go back to school. And I did. I looked at I looked at social work. I looked at just going back and getting a counseling degree. I looked at psychology or sports psychology. And I just really resonated with social work. And I felt very strongly about going into a field that was not driven by the medical model. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, there is just something in me that really struggles with this DSM driven <laughs> world and what's wrong with you and constant illness. And I knew that the field of social work was different and I also really felt passionate about um, owning my own identity as a white woman who is really privileged and um, knowing that if I genuinely wanted to do this work and genuinely wanted to connect with my athletes who were not going to be me more often than not and, and my identity, I knew I needed to get outside of my comfort zone and I knew I needed to grow and I needed to learn. And I knew that social work was also going to provide me with that lens of power and privilege and oppression that I had never really been exposed to. So that is why I went into social work and I will hands down say best decision of my life. I am, I'm so, as I literally the sticky note of the end of the, our social work values is right above my computer. So like, as I look at it, like I'm very yeah. proud. I think it's one of the proudest things I've ever done to become social work. <clears throat> I, uh, I have a bias against a lot of psychologists because they don't practice some of the things that we do when it comes to the biopsychosocial breaking down all these, the systems that people are in the very yep. focused on one different thing and billing. And it's very, not humanistic. Yeah. But besides the point, I have faith in me in this one. I'm going to ask you a question. It's going to sound a little rough, but I have faith that I'm going in a good direction. 
I do. So, you know, you've got some broken bits. Some bro- what makes you a therapist? Why should you be a therapist? You, you're messed up like all the other ones. What the hell you got to offer anyone? You know, I love that question. Um, and I so appreciate it because I do, I do, because I, I, I really think that there is, and I'm going to tell you right now, I have really struggled with imposter syndrome, right? Feeling like, oh my God, like I don't have my shit together. Why should I be the one that's helping people and people with like very significant trauma? Like uh, you should look into my closet. Like there is some serious skeletons up in there. Right. So like, I get it. And I think that is maybe part of the reason why I'm a good therapist, because I'm not, I'm not on a pedestal, right? I am right there with you. And I really think that this, this, this such like almost detrimental view on therapy is that you're going to go to therapy and you're going to sit across from someone and they're going to know more than you know about yourself. And they're going to have the answers and they're going to help you figure it all out. When the reality is, is like, y'all, we are imperfectly, perfectly made and we are whole as we are. And sometimes we just need somebody to hold our hand and to bear witness and to be with us. And I think that sometimes people who have been to hell and back can really do that. And that's one of my favorite things in my job. I mean, I really... Um, one of my mentors is like such a, she really ingrained this into me that like, it's not so much about having the answers. It's about being able to be with and ask the right questions. And I think that's what makes a good therapist. Does that help answer your question? It does. Cause there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are also therapists and healers, caregivers, and they got yeah. stuff. And as we've <laughs> talked about with uh, another uh, sports mental health practitioner, Corey Yeager, Yep. He called me a wounded healer, and I've never heard that term before, a wounded oh, healer. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. Beautiful. And, you know, Spence might have seen it the other day. I posted on LinkedIn, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't run it by you. And, you know, it being an Arab dude, right, and a Mexican dude, you, there's a lot of stuff. And a lot of people post things on social media, this or that, right? Some folks read about some stuff. They see some stuff on the news. But, I mean, they're working with these kids, Arab and Muslim yeah. kids going through things right now. We're in there working with these kids of color, these immigrant kids, right? I embody what we call diversity, equity, and inclusion. A lot of folks just read about it. Mm. You know, this lived experience is for real. It's a real thing. And to be a counselor, to be someone with lived experiences, and then you got a degree, is magnificent. You know, mm. the degree, my dad always jokes, your degree ain't worth shit. I remember I got the degree and I told him that. And then, you know, a couple years later, we're making money. He's like, oh, it looks like that degree was worth something. Uh, and then I got yeah. the doctor and he said, well, I, it looks like it must be worth something because they call you a doctor now. Um, but I always tell students, I'm nobody. Mm. I'm just a dude yeah. trying to help you figure it out. Well, no, Naj, you're magnificent. You're this and that. I said, if you actually knew me, you'd probably be scared of a few things. You'd probably kind of hate me. But I do better every day. And I'm trying to be better. Yeah. Me and Spence trying to be better men every day, mm-hmm. trying to grow every day. And so this wounded healer thing, I just wanted to push on you because you were vulnerable there. You were vulnerable there. And so I was like, look at that. To me, those are always the best counselors because you know what bottom is. How are you going to go to other counselors that are lucky and blessed, not just privileged, but blessed. I mean, they can work, do a lot of good work too, but you don't understand their mind like mm-hmm. someone else, right? When black and brown folks sit in front of me, I understand all the cultural things you don't have to explain it to me. When you talk to someone that's been through trauma, hardship, abuse, physical, mental, sexual, emotional, right? You already know where their mind's at because you've been there. Yeah. There's validity into that. Uh, so I yeah. wanted to appreciate you for that and also help everyone else on the podcast that's listening that also has a trauma history. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're worthless. Yep. doesn't mean that you're broken. Uh, human. You're human. human. And I, I misspoke because I think everyone's broken but there's beauty in the broken bits. I don't think there's such thing as perfection. Yeah. All right. Can I add one thing there? Cause I, I think this, this also is a conversation that, you know, I've been, I, it's starting to circulate right on social media, but also just within like a couple like trauma informed spaces that, that I'm a part of. And I think to, to go off what you're saying, which is like, also if we're actually all invested in the goal of helping people heal and be in connection and community with one another. Why is healing only reserved for a, like a licensed professional or like a doctor or a, right. Mm -hmm. And that's not me saying that, like, I don't value 
the degree that I have or the doctorate that you got. Right. (laughs) And what I'm also saying is, again, if we want to break down, right, the accessibility to care and connection and healing, we have to almost think from different lenses at times, right? Mm -hmm. Like people can heal and we have to have people heal without going to therapy, (laughs) you know? So like, and, and I take that as like, so who am I to say that I'm better than anybody else because I'm a therapist. I'm not right. Like, trust me, I know firsthand I live in my head all day long. Right. Like I'm not. (laughs) Um, so I I think that's another piece of this as well. And like, yeah, yeah, for, I think all the therapists out there, like (laughs) you don't get a gold star for not being broken. right? Like you you just don't. In fact, I think you get a gold star for being broken and bouncing back. Yeah. 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 Resilience, right? I'm gonna kick so. it back over to uh, over to Spence. I just wanted to pivot, take her down a path because she was vulnerable. Yeah, no, yeah, I thanks. appreciate that. And I also have to agree. I think there are plenty of people in our lives that aren't therapists that help us on a day to day basis. Um, so yeah, right. just want to put that out there too. Um, so you you are the director, and you're also on the medical advisory council for Morgan's Message, right? Um, could you explain to us what is Morgan's Message? And what what's your role in there? What do you what do you do? Yeah, Morgan's message is a fantastic. It's I mean, oh my god! Since starting in 2020, I believe it's it's exploded. But it's a nonprofit um, started by the friends and family of Morgan Rogers, who died by suicide in 2019. Um, she was a women's lacrosse player at Duke, and um, heard about this? Or yeah. Um, it's an, it's an incredible, I'm so honored to be a part of this organization. And I got involved with them, um, shortly, uh, I think it was the fall of 2019 because at the time I was living in Durham, I was doing a lot of work and consulting at Duke. And one of the teams I was working with was Duke women's lacrosse. So, um, I really from, from the start got involved with them and was doing speaking engagements and workshops and all this stuff. Um, and then last year about this time took on their, like the director of their medical advisory council. Um, so what that, and and within Morgan's message, right, it's a nonprofit that really, um, aims to create awareness and break down stigma around mental health, specifically in the sport community. Um, they have two main emission, main initiatives. They have a, an awesome podcast, um, the mental matchup, which you guys should definitely check out. Um, mm-hmm. and then they have an education program, which is basically like a peer to peer facilitated, um, awareness and education program. And so my role is really kind of large scale oversight around, okay, so yeah, how do, one of my passions is like trauma informed space. Um, trauma-informed group spaces in particular, because when we're getting together and we're in community and connection and we're talking about mental health, tough stuff is going to come up. Mm. And we, in order to help people feel like they belong and they are included and they can access safety within that environment and have those talks, um, there's stuff we need to make sure, right? There's boundaries, there's expectations, there's group norms. So I oversee that. I also oversee and work with our education program director to actually like create the education and the content that's going out to them. So it's an amazing, and then I'll do some speaking stuff as well, but it's an amazing organization for anyone that's listening. I highly encourage that you guys check it out. And the other cool thing is that we just started what what we're calling our at-large program, which is for people in the community. So you guys could be like at-large ambassadors, people, you don't have to be an athlete to be involved in the organization. So it's really cool. We're doing amazing work. Um, And that's very, um, you know, my role is, is, I guess it's part-time, but it's, we're, we're constantly rolling with that. So it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's amazing. So I'm going to pivot, but on topic. So you do a lot of stuff. And so, you know, yeah. and there's this other thing I read on the page, right? And you're stretching and, 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 and they call it yoga, but it looked like witchcraft. You know, <laughs> it looked like Satan's work. Looked like the devil. If I ever see you it. Know, like, like Bobby Boucher's mom said, you know, they're the devil. <laughs> yoga is the devil. <laughs> Bobby, that's the devil. So yeah. what is this yoga stuff and why okay. is it healing? Is it good for folks? Mm-hmm. The, why do okay. people, why is yoga so recommended? It was one of the best practices for anxiety and mental health. Okay. 
So I love this witchcraft. Yeah. Um, and to go back to your first comment, which is like, you do a lot of things. Yes. I constantly feel like a chicken with my head chopped off running around, but, um, I love it. It keeps me, it keeps I love me chicken. honest. I love chicken. Um, yeah. I mean, Hey, so, okay. I, I love movement based practices. Okay. And I think this really gets into my background in mindfulness and mindfulness intervention. And to be fair, we know, especially in working with trauma, like, <laughs> Somatic based interventions are yep. actually really, they should be the standard, right? Because mm -hmm. we know that really difficult experiences, whether you're going to label them as trauma or not, right? However, you're making meaning of them, they, they get stored in the body. I mean, it's a nervous system thing. It's not a cognitive thing. So Movement-based practices, I, I just really resonate with. They've been a massive part of my own healing. And so, yeah, I did my um, just basic kind of like 200-hour yoga certification. But what I love about yoga, and I don't actually call it yoga. I call it integration. They're integration sessions. So I'll give you I'll give you an example, right? Of, Wait a minute. You're you putting us in the matrix now. Integration. You know, integration. Well, Separate but equal. Separate but equal. <laughs> we don't, we don't, you know, great. It's a separatist state. You don't know. Let me give you this hat right here. Oh my God. Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. Um, so how I might use this in a sports setting or how I do use yes. this is if I'm going to go into a team and we're going to talk about mindfulness, right? Yep. Mindfulness is a, it's quite a buzzword right now, but really it just means, you know, we are paying attention, we're doing it on purpose and we're doing it in kind of this very balanced way, right? It's a great tool, way of being skill for an athlete because it allows us to just like really be where our two feet are. But what we often don't recognize is like, that's not just a mental skill. That's not a thinking thing, right? As we talked about earlier, the, the mind and the body don't operate separately. So we really actually need to get people getting in their bodies. Right. Yeah. And I just find that movement can be really helpful. Athletes tend to really resonate with movement-based practices. So simple stuff like helping an athlete really understand how maybe their mental narratives are impacting their physical body. Right. So I work a lot in lacrosse and in lacrosse, like your grip is a big part of how you handle your stick, right? And how you throw and how you shoot. And so if an athlete is dealing with some really tricky kind of what I call sticky narratives, right? That are kind of getting in the way of their performance. Like what if we dropped into the body for a second and noticed how that's impacting your shoulders or clenching through the muscles or the grip, right? And so then working with the body to release the tension in the shoulders and to adjust the, the, the tension in the grip, right? So it's stuff like that. And I think we can learn those techniques and gain more awareness around our mind-body connection through movement-based practices. And so I call it an integration practice because we're really integrating the mind and the body through movement. Um, we do it in other ways too. I mean, breath work and grounding and all that stuff. But that's why you see yoga pictures. <laughs> Fair enough. I, obviously. Right. I'm always telling you in good faith, take, just go with me. And you did. Um, yep. Because clients, everyone listening is going to be resistant to everything. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Everyone has this PDA pathological kind of demand avoidance when they're told yeah. something's healthy, like oh, I ain't going to do that shit. Ah, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, you know, I already tried it. And it did. Oh, okay. Just calm down for a fucking second. This isn't, this, you know, this isn't voodoo, right? This isn't magic, but I need you to kind of go with it and let's actually try this and it'll work. Yeah. And yeah. all my athletes are like, holy shit. I remember working with my women's hockey team and uh, we're doing the meditations because I'm really, 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 for some reason, I'm gifted at these meditations. I bet you are. You got a nice, smooth voice. Uh, when I actually want, you know, no. <laughs> I knew it yeah. soon. <laughs> What's on the voice? Think about the cookie. Um, but when I actually go into like therapist mode and like, all right, we're doing like trauma work now or like calming regulation, voice changes. And I remember I telling the girls like, hey, I'm going to do this meditation, but it's also like a, what do they call it? A little hypnosis in it too. So I'm going to get their legs to kind of go numb, paralyzed. And one of the girls opened up her eyes and was like, and I was like, oh my God, scared the shit out of me. <laughs> and when we came back to, I said, girl, what was that? She said, I was literally terrified because my legs were like done. I was like, okay. I thought she was like, this shit isn't working. She's like, no, I'm stuck. 
Oh my gosh. Um, and I remember being taught all these, these grounding and meditative things that are only like five minutes, not very uh-huh. long. I'm talking three, five right. minutes. Uh, shout out to my pops uh, who listens to every pod. And he was, he was telling Spencer and me the other day, he said, you know, I listened to your invincible podcast about breathing and all this stuff. And there's all this self-hatred, but we did a meditation, very quick one, like a two minute meditation. And he's like, damn, man, I was freaking out before that. Cause some other stuff was on my mind. And he's like, I was good. Yeah. So he wants me and him to start doing more meditation things at the end of a podcast. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe, but we're meditation te- time. And dad's got a lot of stuff, right. You know, also neurodivergent himself, tons of trauma, prison, you know, a lot of, just a lot of stuff, a lot of loss. And yeah. so for him to get his mind to calm is like a miracle. Uh, yeah. So that was pretty cool. So I appreciate you bringing that up and talking about that. I work a lot with my athletes, a lot with a lot of my students that are autistic. Yeah. We got to buy ourselves four seconds. Emotions mm-hmm. only last four seconds, but us as humans keep re-triggering. So we can buy a four second pause, a um, 30 second pause. Shit, we got a shot going mm-hmm. from a full meltdown at a 10, maybe even suicidality at a 10 to regulating, maybe getting to a seven or a six. And now we can enact a safety plan, the grounding plan. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my, mm, can't yeah. name that because the season's going on and stuff, but got a player that's magnificent and like doing really good right now. I'm like, hey, we're going to do this breath work before we do every set, every rep, before you get into this one stance. And now all of a sudden, everything's opening up. Yeah. Uh, so it's amazing how this stuff can help. Uh, Spence, I'll give you another question if you got any. In there, but if not, we'll get into the show. Yeah. And just kind of also validate uh, just yoga in general. I mean, uh, a lot of great athletes use it. Uh, LeBron James, Kevin Love. Kobe. Um, Kobe. Uh, Calvin Johnson from the Detroit Lions who had an amazing career, Megatron. Hey, yeah. I'm trying to get Joe Johnson to join the podcast, the, one of my favorite Joe players Johnson, of all time yeah. in the NBA. Johnson. He's got his own entire yoga thing and practice going on, massive company. Hey. Trying to get him to come on. Awesome. <laughs> come on, Joe. Get on the show. I saw Joe. I saw Joe. Probably just yelled at him and then I was just like, I'm not doing this. No, All right, bye. See you later. Yeah, I know. All right. So I think we're ready to go into this show. Uh, so, uh, like I said before, we are doing Daisy Jones and the Six, right? So, um, about this group who are just kind of who, who did a show and then they broke up after a show. Like they, they got big and then they broke up afterwards. Um, I saw on here. That it was also like the author of the uh, the book said that they wrote it after um, Fleetwood Mac, like okay. inspiration from that. And if you know Fleetwood Mac, they've had a very troubled um, go as a as a group. Um, but yeah, and so um, the first scene has to do with Daisy, um, one of the main characters. Um, there's a house party going on. Um, she's a young child and she's listening to music, but she's singing very loudly. And so um, her mom hears this and um, just bursts in. And it's just like, nobody wants to hear you sing. Nobody wants to hear that. And so. And then we also have this narrator kind of going through everything, just saying like, hey, um, she did have everything. She had a very, you know, nice sheltered i guess childhood um with rich parents and all that but at the same time she was also alone she was by herself because her parents were really even there um and so um tough childhoods no matter what kind of background you come from can always affect you in the Economic, future yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it doesn't matter um so Kind of want to know what made you want to do this scene. And yeah, let's start there. Yeah. So I'll preface this, which is it, this was a book um, that I read, I mean, I think two years ago, and then it came out as a show. And when I read the book, oh my God, I devoured it in like two days. I thought it was just so, so fantastic, so complex, and so much going on, so many moving pieces. Uh, easily, I'll, I'll say, like, one of I think the best books I've read of all times. Okay. Um, I will say this. I I think they I think this was a Reese Witherspoon production. I, I don't think the show actually captured the full the full depth of the book. But 
I I chose this because I just remembered this scene from the book and then them putting it in the show and just being really profoundly impacted by it, like watching this and something that kept replaying in my head. So I don't know if you guys are um, aware or have heard of um, Lisa Ference. She's uh, has what's called the Ference Institute. She's kind of like a more East Coast, like she's in the Baltimore area. She runs, um, she does fantastic trauma training okay. and- she talks about, uh, she spends a lot of time in her training talking about attachment and uh, we can break attachment down or we can leave it because it is pretty complicated. But, um, you know, the reality is, is when we are born into the world, we have to, for survival, depend on and attach to caregivers, yep. right? Whether it's a mom, grandma, dad, doesn't doesn't matter, right? We we have to, and that attachment, the the connection to our caregivers, is really influential. Either what we receive or what we do not receive. And I think this, for me, this scene right here is just, especially when the part where the mom is like, "No one wants to hear you." Think about receiving that message from someone that is supposed to love you unconditionally and someone that is supposed to help you feel like you belong and you're seen and you're heard. And anyways, I'll go back to Lisa's parents because she talks about how, you know, the best thing we can do for kids is let them shine. Right. I mean, oh my gosh, think about the power of letting kids be and express themselves and be who they're meant to be. And in this scene, right, Daisy has these headphones on and she is just singing, enjoying the music, right? Being a kid. And that is just totally shut down. And think about the message that she, because we know, right? I mean, this is one scene in the movie, but if that's the message that she as a child is chronically receiving from the people that are supposed to love her, wow, think about how impactful that is. And for me, it's just like, you know, so many of the people that I work with as a, whether it's as a clinician, right, um, working as a therapist or as a coach working with athletes, I mean, this is not uncommon. Many, many people grow up with versions of this, 100%. right, in households where they are not allowed to shine. They are not their parents do not want them to sing and their parents don't want to hear them. And just how, uh, yeah, it just, it, it breaks my heart to be honest with you. So um, that's why I chose the scene. And then obviously, you know, I, I think the rest of the the book, right. Is really about, although we can't say, right. I, and I would never sit here and say like, Oh, well she's, you know, goes on to become an addict and struggle and all that stuff because of that. We can't, Th this stuff no. is really complex. Right. Yep. But it 1000% is a piece of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Man, the, the amount of clients that come in, they got that little childhood trauma piece, whether it be, it doesn't always have to be physical abuse. Everyone thinks it's always beatings. Oh. Not a lot of folks go through beatings. The mm -hmm. good majority of my kiddos, clients, they go through just neglect, 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 or just not loving and attentive, not validating, not affirming. And so you're getting at the not affirming stuff, but also I'm sure there was some emotional abuse going on there too. Uh, yeah. So it could be emotional abuse, manipulation, devaluing. You're terrible. Mm -hmm. You're shit. No one wants to hear it. So I think of a young little autistic girl. Having her earphones on, having a blast, you know, dancing and singing you're in a whole nother universe. And then why can't you be normal? Like that yeah. short that we just did on float where the dad, why can't you be normal? But then the dad recovers and he loves the kid. So that trauma yep. is then healed. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my dad was talking to me about this movie that he wants me and Spencer to do from, um, from Netflix. Really sad, but Spencer's agreed. We're going to do it, but with a therapist with us. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's some scenes in there that broke his heart where the parents just annihilated a kid. Um, based on multiple things, one of them being their sexuality. And my father's like, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, so we yeah. talked about the scene from Moonlight, Spencer, where the ma, it goes quiet, and then the kid's just sitting there stuck, and she just yells at him and says horrible things to him. So it's, it's messed up to see how kids can be abused in different ways. Oh, yeah. And then they come to your office, and they're always trying to be perfect. They're mm -hmm. always trying to adjust and, and, and make people proud, and they're always giving too much, and they're getting walked over. So you can see where the childhood stuff reverberates throughout the mm -hmm. eons. 
one of my books to give people for that one is the, uh, the drama of the gifted child. So you might've read mm. that or heard of that one. That's a really good one. So the gifted child is intelligent enough to adapt themselves based on their parents' chaos. Yeah. And so the kid makes themselves smaller or bigger or they, they become a parent, right? It depends. Yeah. Uh, for me, not getting a lot of attention, you know, I was gifted enough to act up. And so I got in trouble a lot. So I got attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so there's certain ways that we do this thing. But yeah, I felt bad for her in that moment. I just thought this little autistic, joyful kid and then just get berated. Uh, Totally. There's no way that doesn't yeah. stick with stick in you. And it's going to be in you every relationship, friendship, romantic yeah. partners. It's always going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing you also mentioned, right, is that it's not, and for all the, the parents that are potentially listening, like it's not about being perfect. Nope. It's about how you repair, right? How you, um, you know, the, the attunement, right, between a parent and a child, it's a dance. And it's not always going to be perfect. I mean, parents, we, we can't be, that's not human, but mm -hmm. How do you then repair, right? How do you then come back into connection with your child and say, recover? Yeah, you recover, right? Um, because that is what allows children, right, to to know that it's not me, yep. right? It's not my my fault. It's not my worthiness. It's not. And and again, like also think about the the parallel to core beliefs here, right? I'm not a huge like CBT person, but like. I mean, just think about how this stuff, right, that we're talking about then impacts the child's core beliefs that they're really carrying through for the rest of their lives. Yep. Beliefs lead to actions. Actions lead to thoughts. Thoughts lead to actions. Actions lead to, it all is tied together. Mm -hmm. It's a good scene. It's a good scene. Sad scene. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm glad I never really had to go too much of that verbal stuff. Mm -hmm. I tell you, my dad though, when when he when I, when I ran away from home and I lived with him, well, he didn't even have to yell at me, Spence. He just looked at me and like, damn, yeah, yeah, yeah. just yeah, and he just looked at me. I'm gonna send you back to your mama's. Oh, yeah. what do you need me to do? <laughs> I'll clean all this shit up. Yep. <laughs> Want need me to paint the house? Okay, <laughs> I'll paint it again. I'll paint it again. Uh, Second time this month. One of my favorite <laughs> quotes of my dad working with him. I get so mad. I quit. He said, good. Now you ain't getting paid. Get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> he won't deny that one either. Some of it said it. You're like, I did it. I say I it to my it. interns all the time. I said, you ain't getting paid anyways, but you better keep working. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not joking. Uh, let's get sure. to the next scene. Yeah. So next scene, we see Daisy again. Um, but this time, she's heavily on the... Uh, the book of sugar. Uh -huh. Yep, just like that. Look at that. Yep, just press your nose right up on the mic. There you go. No one can see or hear that, but it's fine. No, they can. Uh, yeah. and, and so, yeah, then we see it, and then we also see, um, we also see that Billy is kind of also seeing some signs that she's kind of spiraling, going down the tubes there. Um, hmm. kind of goes back to like what we said already. It's just like those past behaviors. Are really kind of catching up to her now maybe they didn't at first maybe in the childhood um but then all of a sudden boom as you get older as the fame gets bigger and bigger and the spotlights on you um then you kind of start to cope with these different things and in negative ways mm -hmm. instead of positive ones and so um when you kind of see any of your athletes or clients um you're working with seeing them kind of spiral like what what do you do to kind of help them through this time? And, you know, um, yeah. Like what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I, the other piece about that scene is like, it's coming off of the first part of it is like the letter. She receives a letter and the letter mm. is. From I thought it was from um, her mama. Yep. Yeah. The mom, the mom reaches out once she gets really big. Right. Uh, and so, yeah. And that then, I mean, it's the first thing she does is pick up the Coke. Um, and so I think this is one of my um, supervisors when I was going through my MSW said this to me and I thought it was so profound, like all behavior is meaningful. Yep. All behavior is meaningful, right? Um, and so I really am such a believer in, you know, especially for my athletes who are spiraling or maybe like uh, turning towards maladaptive coping strategies is to, uh, the first thing, honestly, is to like, uh, the the number one thing I'm I want to try to do is remove the shame. Mm. I want to remove the shame. I want to humanize. I want to validate. I want to normalize because the reality is is like 
they're not alone, <laughs> right? They're not the only ones doing what they're doing. Um, yet they feel that way. And there's, there's a lot of shame. And if we remove the shame, right, we can then more often than not do, do the work. Yep. Um, but the first thing is, yeah, I mean, I am such a, like, I don't make it wrong. I tr I try really hard in some of this, like for my, you know, other therapists and coaches out there is like uh, one thing that I'm really constantly checking is like my own facial expression and my own body language when they share something like that with me, right? Especially if it is around substance abuse, because the last thing that I want them to pick up on is that I'm judging them. I want them to know and give them full permission, right? To be in, in connection with me and know that like, I, I'm not going to judge. Right. And I think again, you, you know, you asked the question earlier about like, why should you be a therapist? Like, been there, right? Like I, you know, there isn't much that I haven't seen in my life. Right. And so I really want them to know right off the bat that like, there's actually a lot of this makes sense. And again, I think for, for substance abuse in general, many people use substances for a reason. It's again, cool. that behavior is meaningful. Yep. And why would we, sh why do we think shaming people is going to actually help them? <laughs> like, I don't know. That's just, I, I, it's never felt okay to me. It's never felt right. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Right. Um, really getting into this piece around like, and, um, uh, Lisa Ferentz, who I've mentioned earlier, who's just, she calls, um, you know, what, what people may call like maladaptive coping mechanisms or negative, you know, coping methods as like they're, they're creative, to be honest with you. Right. They're creative survival coping mechanisms, because more often than not, people are turning to things to numb. They are turning to things to forget them. Right. They are trying to cope. They're trying to cope with the pain, trying to the, live. the lived experience. Yeah. They, they're trying to survive. Um, and that at a fundamental level is not wrong. So, um, I don't, I, I think I may have done a spinoff off your question there, but that's fine. I got going. I so <laughs> you, you pivoted towards, you know, drugs, alcohol, substance abuse, mm -hmm. and how to work on, you know, getting rid of the shame. So then I do that. Yep. But then you go from the harm reduction because at mm -hmm. the end of the yeah. day, you know, the shit's getting in the way. Totally. So I'll be like, okay, we get rid of shame. Yep. It's the same thing with cutting or, yeah. or you know, self-harm. Okay. Self -harm, yep. Say trick it to the mania and picking eyebrows, things like that. Right. You know, people are ashamed. Same mm -hmm. thing as intrusive thoughts of suicide, yeah. harm to others, Absolutely. get rid of shame. Well, now it doesn't have control of us. Mm -hmm. So now that big yeah. bad wolf is scary and it's a monster. But now if we train it now, it's just one of our pets and we can just chill with it and sit with it. Oh, I love that. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll share a YouTube video. It, it, it's, it's great little, uh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Supposedly it's a native American story. So, hmm. um, gotta, gotta put citations in that. Um, yeah. and so how do we remove the shame and then get them away and move it into a harm reduction? Mm -hmm. Cause Hey man, we got stuff to do and I'll pivot with some of my boys. Cause a lot of athletes doesn't matter what gender masculinity dominance we're not going to touch emotions. I'll say, but you're mm -hmm. going to do the drugs and alcohol now. And to me, that's the biggest coward move you could do. You know, what are you talking about? I ain't no coward. Well, you're running from doing all the work with me and you're treating everyone else like shit. Well, that seems like a coward move just because you don't want to go inside. Mm. Before I get to that, obviously I built a deep connection and they have good faith that no matter what, I'm going to yeah. lead them into right. a good direction. Just first session. Just like, you're a coward. Like what? First hey, minute of work. First session. You a punk. <laughs> Uh, you, all right. Well, never doing this I again. I lift more See than you. You will pump. You know. All right. Well. <laughs> yeah. You know. I just weigh one twenty. What am I supposed to I don't do? Care. <laughs> okay. I don't care. I got one of the strongest women in America that's on my squad now, and and she and she's tiny. So she whooped my ass. <laughs> she, <sorry. laughs> she tiny. She right. squat like five hundred pounds. It's fucking nuts. Jesus. My Love back hurts thinking about that. Oh my wow. god. She can put up some wow. weight. All right. Um. <laughs> So I like to do that with my really masculine dudes. Cause I'm like, how is this masculine mm. running away from it? And, but also the TV fucks us up, man. All you see mm -hmm. on TV, I hate it. It's something bad. They have a bad day. They go get alcohol. Something bad happens. They get anxiety. They have an argument with their partner. I go get some alcohol every single time. Something bad happens. So we're teaching people through cinema on how to do these unhealthy coping mechanisms. Mm. 
instead of doing things like this, where we're talking and communicating, sitting with one another. Spencer just yeah. had me watch a magnificent clip from Sopranos. Go uh-huh. figure, Sopranos. Where these very masculine men are sitting and look at each other. Hey, man, how come you didn't love me? Mm. We asked his young son, Christopher, metaphorical son. Hey, you thinking about suicide? What's going on? You okay? You having intrusive thoughts? Mm-hmm. The kid's like, oh, you know, I'm not having those. That's for mental midgets. So that's <laughs> the word he used. He did. And then Tony's like, no, nah, man, for real, how you doing? Mm. Those moments there are how we healthily cope. But the thing is, everyone's so scared to be vulnerable. That's why yeah. I affirmed you being vulnerable earlier, because no one else wants to do it. Yeah, well, thank you. And the the other piece, right? And this is going to tie back to the clip of what? this is why I picked these two clips of the the, da- the young Daisy, right, with the the mom, and then now is I think people forget that we or just don't know, don't make the connection that we learn how to regulate and be with our emotions based off our parents, oh. right? Like our <laughs> parents. I mean, talk about again, oh, right? Man. That that attachment piece, right? Um, if you have a parent, right, that is constantly shaming you, oh, okay. constantly or or neglectful, right, yeah. just not there at all. How is that child supposed to learn any affect regulation? They they're not going to, right? So then, of course, right, as they grow up and they move through adolescence and they move through teenage years and and into adulthood. They never learned that that was never modeled for them. They weren't having these conversations, right? With their parents, they weren't seeing that. And so again, right, it makes a ton of sense that it would be a lot easier for them. And the only way that they know how to cope is to pick up cocaine, right? Or to drink or to cut or to, right? Healthy relationship, so, unhealthy. I mean. yeah, healthy relationships, right? So like a huge piece of, and, and this even gets into nervous system work, right? Like I, I think there is this like huge trend on Instagram and TikTok in particular around like nervous system regulation and regulate your nervous system, regulate your nervous system. And like people, we, self-regulation comes second. Co-regulation comes first, right? Because again, we come into the world being born as babies, having to co-regulate, having to. We cannot survive on our own. We have to regulate with our caregivers. So co-regulation is what actually paves the way to self-regulation. So again, right, in those really kind of early childhood years, if we don't have that co-regulation, right, that connection, that attachment and attunement with our parents, holy crap. Well, of course, right? Things like, again, these creative coping mechanisms or maladaptive coping coping mechanisms are going to take over. So that's the only other point that I wanted to make. Damn. That's all I can say on that one, Spence. You saw my face. Spence knows my face. I'm like, God, there's some good shit. Yeah, there. Like, that's the good cocaine. <laughs> that girl cooking with that's a hot, the mental cocaine. She cooking with that hot spoon, you know. <laughs> oh my god. That spoon hot as shit, boy. I, tell you. I feel like we need a disclaimer on this show that like no cocaine is present. Like, no, no not yet. Um <laughs> I don't know. Like actually, you know, cocaine is present. You know, You're right. Not yeah. on your side, you know. <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, correction. We don't condone any violence on this podcast or any drug uses. We do not like cocaine on this podcast. But we love weed. <laughs> All right. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> um, so, pause. <laughs> That co-regulation is magnificent, magnificent what you just said. And then leads into the regulation piece, you know, individual work. Uh, uh-huh. We're going to talk about racial shit real quick. Um, oh, all right. Bring it in. Yep. Well, because a lot of these black and brown families, depending on where you're coming from, lower socioeconomic families. Fair. Again, it's dominance, masculinity. Yeah. So volatility, that's what wins. That's what allows you to survive. So yeah. you're not really taught these depths of emotionality and these things. So I'm with a, my mother and my father, dominance, dominance. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. And so, right, pops has got a short fuse. Mom, short fuse, right? They said that they were bipolar, not bipolar. And so they'll get labeled with borderline personality disorder, though. Yes. That's what they'll be labeled with uh, because they're hot and cold with their emotions. And there's reasons for that. And so all my kids of color by white clinicians will get diagnosed with borderline personality disorder when actually it's just trauma. It's just totally. trauma. 
And, you know, they shame the kids, and then they don't want to help and work with the kids, or they'll label them with ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. That's what they label Mm -hmm. me as. Yeah. And so you're also going to get a lot of autistic people that fall into this, too. Because they can't regulate or they might do a little self-harming, then we shame them, we label them as borderline, actually autistic. Yeah. And then folks of color, we never get labeled with anything close to autism. And so to help deal, I'm talking about this because also people of color, the substance abuse is pretty high. But also yeah. amongst folks that are neurodivergent, autistic, ADHD, tons of self-medications with alcohol, marijuana, uh, you know, mushrooms. You're going to see a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. That's because they're trying to disconnect and dissociate. Yeah. They're trying to stop all the thoughts. And so I'm like, hey, man, I ain't going to shame it, but we got to find better ways. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe their parents weren't the best at it. I know mine weren't. Pretty good now. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. you know, still. Spence goes, you know, maybe, yeah. uh, but I'm not the best at it either. Um, still learning. <laughs> I'm a grown ass man. But the thing is with you, I, I'm not going to ask you weight and height, but I'm sure you're not six two, three hundred fifty pounds. So when I get a little mad, it gets a little scary. Uh, mm-hmm. and you know, my coworkers might get a little like, oh shit. And I was just mad. Well, yeah. Cause you guys keep saying this bullshit. Um, so I, I have to regulate quicker. Now we're going to pivot and talk about women's issues. Mm-hmm. Y'all got to regulate quick as shit too, right? Because, you know, oh, you're a bitch. Oh, you're crazy. Yeah. Oh, you're aggressive. Yeah. And so you got to regulate pretty quick too. And if you're a woman of color, even more so. I was just going to say, yeah. Uh, if you're a dude, large dude like me, then you definitely do because now they're going to call the police on me, which, which has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've learned as I got older, like, oh, shit. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, Spencer doesn't see me going crazy like my dad every once in a while. I'm be like, you know, I'll kill you. <laughs> I love my dad. Uh, I got all the good in the bed from him. All the good in the bed. It's funny. Real quick pause. Um, I tell my students, hey, you think you're paying for this master's degree, but most of the education comes from my father. No degree. Nine years in the penitentiary. And I said, so just to let you know, this is what you paid for. But it's some of the most magnificent yeah. healings they're ever going to get in teachings in yeah. their life. I just yeah. know how to word it and get to where we need to get. Totally. Magnificent scene. I'm glad you brought this up with addiction and drug use. It's very, very correlated with our population. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's pivot over to Bobby. Uh, Billy. I know. You know, I like, <laughs> saying, you know? You know I like saying you Bobby. And, well, time, time. Sure. You know. uh, so Billy. Uh, Billy Bob. Concert. Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, t- t- thank you. Uh, having a concert. Um, then all of a sudden they spot this man in a plaid suit jacket and uh, uh-huh. get really pissed off and just get off stage. Um, come to find out, it's his papa. It's his dad. And um, obviously we see that uh, his dad left them, him and his brother, um, just to left the whole family and uh, left them a guitar. Mm. Um, One of the things that, and then he throws that guitar on the ground, say, fuck you, dad. How about that? Real punk rock before punk rock was a thing. So just saying, Um, yeah. And, you know, kind of coordinate with the scene that um, the next scene with that is that then we see him doing cocaine um, as he finds out his girlfriend is prego. Yeah. So um they, they he knew that they were having a baby but it's kind okay. of this like um y- you know it, it's yeah the the piece around his father right finding that and and to give a little backstory the dad left their family abandoned them and said claimed that he moved to Georgia right which is like you know eight states away come to find out he was literally across town the whole time mm. <laughs> with like another wife. So that then is really the start of his substance use, drinking, drugs. And then, yes, he and the woman that he's with, they actually do end up getting married, um, find out that they're pregnant. And this is then the piece of, you know, right before that he finds out. And then that kind of goes into just this. And you see, I didn't show this part, but the there's this clip where like he finds out and the realization hits him. Right. And it's like, Oh boy. Right. Like this is really happening. Right. Like I'm going to be a dad. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's right off the bat, 
um, only because I have so many clients that also deal with abandonment, whether it's a mom, a dad, a, a, a different primary caregiver, but oh, abandonment can stir up a lot of, a lot of things, right? Um, and this was one that clearly impacted him. Again, we can't really sit in this position of saying, oh yeah, that's it, right? That's the, the sole reason why he, you know, goes off on a binger and becomes an addict. No, it's, this stuff is really complicated, but again, it's, it, it is absolutely a pivotal piece of what he's navigating. I'm going to speak real quick, then I'm going to kick it right back to you, boss. Um, you know, Spence, strategic, but we did an old clip, Mike Tyson biopic TV show, and I love yep. always referring to this, is when you hit the kid after you've been working a while, it's just, man, you talk about how good they're doing this and that, right? And they'd be like, it's you, it's you, the therapist, you did it. No, I, you did this. I didn't do shit. I met with you six hours in like five months, probably three months. It's all you. And then I tell the kid, you know, man, you're just so easy to love and you're not supposed to use that, but you know, I use it. Mm -hmm. Some of these kids, you invest love and time and love and time. And then you see them grow. And my God, just with a few hours and a few months, you're like, it's all it took. And you reflect back on that little bit of love and watering. Mm -hmm. You were so easy to love means they already had everything they already needed. I, you know, why can't their parents do it? I don't know. Yeah. Something must be deeply flawed in that parent, not you, kiddo. But even without you never being watered, mm. never being watered, then I'll turn to my computer, I'll pull it up, and I said, even flowers grow in the desert. Desolate, no rain. And then the mm -hmm. kid usually tanks. Uh, yeah. And that's true. Some of us have no watering at all. Yeah. None at all. But somehow we still become magnificent. Mm -hmm. You know, so I deal with a lot of kids with those parent issues. Uh, yeah, why can't my mom do this? Why can't my dad show up? Why can't they just be normal? I, I don't know, kid. They got their own shit and they just can't show up. They can't. Totally. They can't. Uh, so again, another good scene. Um, I, I wonder, because you said a lot of people deal with these issues. I feel like Spence with the folks that are in the autistic community, I think it's even higher, man, because most of the time, parents sure. don't even know that they're neurodivergent or autistic. And then the kiddo, they don't know how to love the kiddo because the way the parent loves is different than the way the kiddo needs to be loved. And so you get this. Maybe they were good parents, but they never fully got engaged with the kid. They never maybe invested in their art or their craft or their music or their Pokemon. And thus, they always felt neglected and bullied. Always be normal. That's what I was thinking about while watching the scene. Yeah. And then you get this dad that just doesn't show up and you're like well now you're just a piece of shit you know mm -hmm. that ain't got nothing to do with you trying and you didn't meet them you just suck yeah. so that, yeah that's a tough one there that's a tough scene you know uh the dad just doesn't show up and, and i'm not joking i've got multiple clients spence mm -hmm. where they've done these blood tests with the the 23 and me's mm -hmm. and it turns out they got siblings down the street yeah. down the street and my yeah. clients are like, what the shit? I got this whole family I didn't even know about. And then my client mm -hmm. is like, I fucking hate my dad because they hid this family. Or I hate my mom because they hid this family. Uh, yeah. So, right, this isn't crazy. This is like real stuff that happens where the parent will skip out, be down the street. 23 and totally. me catching people up, man. Yeah, no, oh my God, T to that, there was something that was circulating. I can't remember where it was, but it was like, if you want to ruin families, do not give 23 and me around Christmas time. Like don't give it as a gift. That's what they did. It actually like, yeah. I mean, it's, that's very real. <laughs> Who would give a test for Christmas? I don't know. <laughs> people want to find out their ancestry and like, nah. yeah, but <laughs> they were a Nazi. You're like, God damn it. God. But then, you know, I, I think there, you, you raise a really interesting point. Right. And I think this then, this then and that, why I love this, why I love the book, right? And the show yeah. is because you really see the the depth of emotion that can come from these wounds, right? These these parent attachment wounds, right? The abandonment, right? Which is there is so much. I mean, if if we could peel back the layers of people's skin and see the emotion that is moving inside of people, I mean, oh my gosh, right? Like 
the grief and the anger and the sadness and the raw pain. I mean, there is a lot there. And then potentially, right, that internalization, right? The shame. Is it, is it me? Am I the one that is not worthy of loving? Right. Because we know that, that people go there as well. I mean, they're, they're, these are just, they're, they're so incredibly complex. And again, I think it then ties back into that piece of like, Hey, how we as human try to make meaning and, and navigate and cope with that shit. It makes a lot of sense. More often than not, it makes a ton of sense why people are going to whatever they're going to in order, in order to cope. So you said at 26, you had that identity crisis, Mm -hmm. you know, right. And, you know, some of my kids have it before college, some of it's during college, some of it's after college. Yeah. A lot of my international kids is work, 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 work. And then they never know anything other than intelligence and intellectualizing. And then they come to me like, Hey man, so I'm going to kill myself by the time I'm 21. I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. Well, we got one year. Yeah. And I said, why? Because I'll never experience anything other than work. Mm. And what do I do after work? So then it's about figuring out what the hell life is the meaning. Uh, totally. And it gets super scary. It gets super scary. The way it affects relationships, I think about this scene, is how someone in this scene position of the dad grows up with, okay, they're unlovable. Mm-hmm. Because the parent didn't stay. So that means that they're the unlovable one. Right. So that leads to they treat themselves like shit. And then they get in relationships with shit. And so that Uh person's either cheating on them, using them financially, emotionally, Uh you know, you know, I got one of my favorite humans currently. Every human is graduating. Um, And it's just a lifelong time of just, you know, believing that they suck. Parents are awesome, but parents are magnificent. They're not the issue, but there's a lot Uh of neurodivergence that leads them to feeling awkward, which allows Uh them to get bullied and pushed on, right. And pushed on. And it just soaks into almost everything. Uh, yeah. And and I get so angry as a therapist too because people are taking advantage of my person. Mm. And it, you know, the closer you get to me, the more protective I get. And the more protective I get, then it's harder to hide my emotions. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big boy, so those emotions come out sometimes. And I'll be sitting there like, I'm gonna kill this kid. <laughs> I'm, I looked at a few clients. I'm like, I just need an address. We. Why you need that? You, you, you give me. What car to drive? Is it green? <laughs> it, is it? I know some people in Flint can handle some shit now. You know? We do not condone violence on this no, podcast. No, we're joking. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. All right. Wait. Well, hey, whatever y'all say. You don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Did well, not give a specific uh, location of where you would find people. What happens in Flint stays in Flint. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for real, it's it's really tough when you're taking care of these kiddos and you, uh, you know, it, it's hard. It's really hard when you get connected and you love people, man. Especially as a wounded healer, because you don't want to see them be taken advantage of. Yeah. Small little pivot. Um, have you dealt with any clients that are getting ready to have a baby or that are, are pregnant? Or any of that stuff? Uh, or no, not so much. Because I know you're like maybe younger yeah. college age. You've had some kids get pregnant. No, especially in, uh, no, cause like, so I have my business and then I have like me as a therapist, I, I okay. keep them separately. And like as a therapist, I mean, no, I've got clients into fifties, sixties. So, um, yeah, I actually, okay. um, just had a client become a parent for the first time about three months ago. Um, and wow, I'm not a mom yet. Um, uh, hopefully one day. So I can't, you know, fully understand where mm-hmm. my client is. Right. But mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, oh my goodness, what a um roller coaster. Really life changing, right? Um, and so again, right, if we go back to that kind of analogy of peeling back the layers and seeing the emotion inside, I mean, wow, so much fear and 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 again, we we all have to remember that like at a foundational level, right? We we learn and inherit so much from our families of origin, right? And we, at the end of the day, right? If we do the work and we have awareness, we have a choice, right? Whether we want to take things from our family of origin and our caregivers that were really supportive and helpful and beneficial, and we're going to pass that on to our children, or do we want to break that, right? 
Do we want to break that cycle? Do we want to be different? Do we want to love differently? Do we want to connect differently? And so I think that's a piece with this client in particular that I've seen take shape, which is such a, um, wow, it's really hard. It's really hard. I think as a, I, I can imagine as a new parent to, I think, admit that, wow, there's pieces of my parents that actually weren't good enough. And I, I don't, I don't want to bring that to my child. That's really hard. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, definitely. I want people to reflect back. If you listen to this podcast, please go back to the invincible podcast that dropped out a couple of weeks before this, maybe a month before this about a young man, not wanting to be like his father. It's an animated series also on Amazon. Uh, and the stuff that we grab from that is like heartbreaking. Because the dad's supposed to be a superhero, ends up being like this mass genocidal maniac of people. And the kid's a good kid. He's just a magnificent kid. But then he loses his shit. And then he's like, I am my dad because I lost my shit. And that leads to a big trauma spike, massive trauma spike. And it looks like he's actually going to take his own life in one of the clips. Um, So you're right. The family stuff can mess you up. Yeah. Shout out to anyone listening uh, to the pod uh, that's dealing with drug and alcohol issues to help with the trauma and cope. Uh, it's tough. You're going to relapse. Mental health is a, is constant relapses, man. You want two steps forward, one yeah. step back. It's part of the program. You know, you, yeah, you go to therapy, you, you mean, maybe you got to go back to therapy, you know, shit happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so don't, don't shame yourself and then just go full off the wagon. That that's where you get screwed. One of my, I'm in with this. One of my clients, they said, uh, I did all this shit now. I, said, I did everything you told me. I, did, I went to class. I'm sleeping better. I broke up with this asshole. I'm off all the drugs, cocaine. And life is boring. Mm. But you're doing good in school. You're going to graduate. And you, you respect yourself and you're healthy. But it's boring as shit and I'm alone. Why? Well, it's because you're not letting toxic people around you no more. You get to go choose and do good things and expect better people. But I'm alone now. Mm. So it, it's tough. It's a tough phase. So for those of you that are going through that, continue to make your community. Continue to stay healthy. And if you fall off the wagon a little bit, which that person did, then they didn't come to therapy for a while because they were so ashamed to come back to me. And then eventually they did. Yeah. And then eventually they graduated. Uh, but it's a yeah. tough cycle. Yeah, totally. I mean, and sorry, last point here is that yeah. like, that's one of the hardest, hardest pieces around substance use, right? Because when, I mean, using has been such a part of their affect regulation, their emotion navigation, right? So yeah. then when that's, when they're clean, right? When we're not using, of course, yeah, we are, It is. I mean, it is, it's raw, right? It's really hard. And so then the work becomes raw. around building their capacity to, to be with that, right? To be with emotion and difficult experiences in a new way that is healthy, right? It's healthy and it's hard, right? But you know, the reality is, is that we are not immune to pain. Pain is going to come baby. Right. And, and the name of the game is how do you build your tolerance for it? Um, how, how do you build your tolerance for it without reaching for again, those kind of creative or maladaptive coping mechanisms? Yeah, that's when I would lean on a lot of the cultural heritage of ancestors or, yeah. the, or I'd lean back on the gender and being strong woman. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's when I changed my voice like I just did now. Yeah, this is a good one. I'm glad you came on the podcast, man. I'm just excited. Lovely individual. I've appreciated you so much today. The energy. Uh, likewise. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, your energy is great, too. This was fantastic. This is so f- it, easily one of the most fun podcasts I've ever been on. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, the last the last person said we was brilliant. You, know. you are. This is oh, a real yeah. idea. Didn't Fantastic. force that at all. <laughs> Fantastic idea. I love it. I love it. I you want to come back. You want to come okay. back? Well, you know. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about it. That, uh, <laughs> that must be. Well, don't go that far. <laughs> that must be the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I got the sugars. Well, I'm drinking water. <laughs> sure. All right. <laughs> That's what my athletes say. Hey, vodka looks clear too. Let me tell you. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for coming on. Uh, any plugs before yeah. you get off the show? Plugs. Please? Yeah, I. I mean, I'm. I feel like I'm a pretty accessible person as long as you can type Emily Perrin. Um, but 
YouTube. Um, uh, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, okay. It's Emily Perrin. I have Instagram, Emily Perrin LMSW. I'm on Twitter, Emily L. Perrin. My website is Perrin Wellness and Performance. Um, yeah, I've got a couple free like downloads, resources for athletes, um, okay. tons of stuff. Um, you name it, it's probably on the internet. So Okay, I'll do my best to click hyperlink most of the, all the good stuff that I want to share with people. So you're going to be, you're also going to be plugged. I'll find it. Spence, Spence is the best snoop there is. He found your social somewhere. Uh, well, you know, it said it ain't Don't worth nothing, it. but he got it. You know, we're actually just going to sell it <laughs> to what we call the immigrants. <laughs> hey, we're your information is gone. So. <laughs> it's gone. You know, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> no, much love. Definitely <laughs> a perfect individual to be doing this work. Uh, any of that self-doubt or imposter syndrome you got going on, that's bullshit. So mm-hmm. don't even believe Thank that you. shit. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. You guys are awesome. Yeah, yeah. So much love. Uh Spence, let's uh let's take it away. All right. Yeah. Thank you once again, Emily, for coming on. Um go check out our Be a Man uh collection that we have on. I have the hat on. Be a man. Talk. This isn't a it's not one of those hats. It's Hold not. Uh, uh it's not, people. All right. I want to hear no shit on the internet once this episode comes out um so thank you once again uh i'm spencer that's nice different spectrum podcast all right everyone you remember now take care of yourselves or don't that's completely up to you peace